Good evening. My name is Dr. David Doman, and welcome to another edition of House Call. My guest this evening is Dr. Martha White, a noted specialist in allergy right here in Montgomery County. Dr. White, welcome to House Call. Thank you. Glad my, to be here. My pleasure. So briefly tell our viewers about your professional background. Well, I'm a practicing allergist and immunologist, but I have a research background from the NIH where I studied immunology and, and inflammation for about nine years. And when I left, I started up a asthma and allergy practice, did a lot of clinical research, done about 250 clinical trials. Mm. Um, but now I'm full-time seeing patients and thoroughly enjoying it. And where do you practice allergy? We have uh, two locations. I'm out of the practice in Wheaton, mm. middle of Silver Spring, and then we also have a location in Chevy Chase. Very nice. Institute for Asthma and Allergy. Very nice. So one of the hot topics, as you know, in allergy now is food allergy. Explain to our viewers briefly what exactly is food allergy. Ah. That's actually not as crazy a question as some people might think um, because people can be sensitive to a food because it bothers their stomach or they might actually be allergic to a food. So with a food allergy, you've made something called IgE. It's a little Y-shaped molecule that recognizes a specific food like milk or peanut. And then when you eat that food, it causes a reaction that can be anywhere from a few hives on the skin, shortness of breath, wheezing, fainting, vomiting, um, can be lethal. Um, the food irritation, like what we get with um, a lactose deficiency, makes your stomach hurt, might make you wish you were dead, but won't actually huh. accomplish that, yeah. that end. But a food allergy can actually kill you. So this is basically the immune system misbehaving in the presence exactly. of select it foods. Exactly. It's the immune system thinking that a food is something harmful and like a worm and going after it. Right. What are some examples of foods that are notorious on the hit parade for food allergies? Well, there are seven groups. So in young children, babies, milk, eggs, peanut, soy, wheat, fish, and shellfish are the most common. Mm -hmm. um, as you get older, you can just suddenly develop a nut allergy peanut, tree nut, or an allergy to seafood like shellfish, or sometimes fish. Uh, is it a your impression that the general medical community and the general public is now more aware of food allergy, or is food allergy truly much more common than it used to be? Both are happening. So I think people are more aware there's more media coverage of it, but there's been an increase in food allergy as well as allergy in general and asthma over about the last two decades or so. We're not completely sure why. Some of it has to do with, um, with avoidance of, of allergenic foods during early childhood. As it turns out, if you eat foods that are highly likely to cause food allergies between the ages of four and 11 months, you're far less likely to develop an allergy to those foods. So there is a, um, a time during our immunologic development when it's really important to be exposed to potential allergens. And if you're not, and you get exposed later, then if you have the right genes, then you'll develop an allergy. With that knowledge in hand, has the um, allergist group communicated that to the American Academy of Pediatrics? Absolutely, yes. And the pediatricians are really on board. Um, they are recommending that moms start feeding, or parents, start feeding their children the more highly allergenic foods early. Um, if there is a, um, a family history of food allergy, they'll oftentimes have the parents bring that child into um, an allergist just to be sure it's okay to start proceeding. But the earlier, the better. Um, we're recommending that mothers not restrict their own diets if they're breastfeeding, um, and they shouldn't restrict their diets while they're pregnant either. One of our mistakes was thinking that restricting the diet when you're pregnant or breastfeeding or not feeding a child an allergenic food till they were two 
would actually help, and that turned out not to be the case, unfortunately. Now, you've implied that there is a genetic risk then for food allergies. There is. Um, we inherit the ability to develop an allergy in general, whether it's food, whether it's hay fever, whether we develop asthma, um, but you don't actually get the disorder unless you have the right circumstance. Besides uh, somebody telling you they suspect an allergy to food such as peanuts, how do you diagnose it? Usually there's a history of I ate a peanut and I got hives on the face or I got short of breath or my voice changed or I threw up um, or a combination thereof or I fainted. Um, if it's something that they eat every single day, um, that might be a little bit more difficult, but, but usually you can look and say every time I have milk, the hives get worse or the eczema gets worse. Um, about 40% of children with eczema will have food allergy, um, but, but usually there's some history of reaction. Are there any objective tests you can uh, obtain to screen for food uh, allergy? Yes, there are, and I'll say one other thing. Children are smart. So oftentimes the parents will come in and they recognize that I gave the kid peanut butter and, and he or she developed hives. And I'll go into the history and say, well, does he eat milk? Does he eat eggs? Well, yeah, he, don't, he, won't, he just refuses eggs. And, and you go and test and lo and behold, the kid won't eat eggs because they're allergic and it goes in the mouth, there's a sixth sense, they don't want it. Right. So they just refuse. So I, I look at all of the, the potential allergens, not just the ones that they walk through the door saying they've had this reaction. Sure. Um, so your question is, can you test? Can you do test? A test for it? Yes, there's two ways to test. Um, you can do skin testing and you can do a blood test called a RAST. Mm -hmm. um, and I do both, especially in the, the really young children. Sometimes one's positive, sometimes the other is for you know, whatever reason. Um, but while the parents are sitting in the room with the child, they can see the skin test turn positive. And it's when you see that big mosquito bite looking thing where the where they were pricked with peanut, it's pretty obvious that they're allergic. The beauty of the blood test is that we now have component testing for a lot of the allergens. So say a child is allergic to milk. Um, we can do component testing on the blood test to milk and tell whether or not they're likely to be able to eat a baked product that has milk in it versus not eat that baked product. Or we can follow the blood work and see whether or not they look like they're outgrowing. So we have component testing for milk, eggs, soy, and peanut, oh, um, and some of the tree nuts, cashew and walnut. And so that's been very helpful. Now, years ago, when you released RAS testing for food allergies, mm -hmm. the preliminary impression was they were not very reliable. Uh, is the newer generation of testing better? It is better. Um, but that's part of the reason why I, I look both ways. Yeah. You can have a with test. With skin testing, too. With skin testing, too. Yeah. It's very rare to have a negative skin test um, and, and a true allergy. It does happen, um, especially in a baby. Mm -hmm. Their skin's a little bit twitchy. Yeah. Uh, but I like to look with both directions. But the, but the blood test is giving us more information now than it used to 10 years ago. So once you've confirmed clinically or with objective testing, that somebody has a targeted food allergy. What do you say to the patient and parents if it's a child in terms of treatment options? Well, if they're actually allergic to the food, they need to avoid it. Um, and they need to carry epinephrine because food allergy can be lethal. I mean, most patients, the vast majority of patients don't die from their food allergies, but it's possible. So you mm -hmm. need to be prepared for the worst um, and have that EpiPen, RVQ, whatever the epinephrine auto injector where the child is. Um, mama's purse, diaper bag, wherever. School. Um, school, absolutely yeah. school. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they need to start reading labels. Fortunately, the major food categories are all, um, the, the manufacturers are all required to list um, ingredients. If they have, at the end of the ingredient list, they'll, they'll say contains peanuts, contains tree nuts. So if you're allergic to something major, um, then you can pretty easily find it. If it's something minor, you really have to get good at reading labels. Besides avoidance and using a epinephrine pen, adrenaline, mm -hmm. if there's an emergency, is there um, any role for antihistamines for this group? That's a really good question. So um, yes and no. 
Antihistamines after epi. So if you have an allergic reaction to a food, and all it is is just a few little bumps around the mouth, and antihistamine is probably going to be fine. But bear in mind that an allergic reaction to a food can take off like a freight train. So mm -hmm. it might start minor and then just take off. Right. And if you look at people that have bad reactions to foods, it only takes 30 minutes before they go unconscious. Wow. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour for Benadryl to kick in. Mm -hmm. It takes three minutes for Epi to kick in. But do you think um, antihistamines would be useful as a daily preventative to um, make episodes less frequent, less severe? No. No? No, I, I wouldn't no. recommend that. It's great for, like, nasal allergies. Right. But if you don't eat the food you're allergic to, you're not going to have a reaction. So right. just don't eat it. Does the allergy community think there's any future role for some sort of desensitization, for example, for peanut right. allergy? There's been a lot of work on desensitization. Uh, we were very hopeful that the patches would be um, useful, and unfortunately those data did not look good. Um, there are some protocols for doing oral desensitization, but none of the protocols are designed to allow you to just eat the food. Right. They're designed for people who have terrible peanut allergies where you're afraid that with a tiny little exposure your child's going to die. Um, but in those protocols, almost every child has allergic reactions while they're building up. And it doesn't give you long-lasting uh, results. You have to stay on peanut. And it's a, it's a difficult protocol. So you have to go into the office every other week when you dose the child at home. The parents have to be there. They can't exercise at all for two hours before or two hours after. So if you're a soccer mom thinking that this is going to be something you want to do for your kid, you really need to think twice about this. Um, most children outgrow their food allergies. Um, that's less likely to happen with nut allergies. Mm -hmm. But I do see children outgrowing peanut and other, other nut allergies. And they almost always outgrow their, their egg and, and uh, their milk allergies. So at this point, I, the, for the vast, vast majority of people, it's tincture of time. Follow the blood, see if they look like they're outgrowing. And when, in our office, if it looks like they're likely to be able to eat the food, then we have them do a challenge in the office just to make sure under our guidance that, that they're okay. And if they react, then we're there to treat. We have one minute before the break. Mm -hmm. are, are adults who first present with food allergies different in, in terms of how you treat them? Uh, they are less likely to outgrow. Adults usually will present with nut allergies and shellfish. They, they avoid and they carry their epis, but that, that's probably a lifelong allergy, unfortunately. And circling back to what you mentioned with the attempts to use desensitization patches, is there any role for desensitization shots, so-called allergy shots? Well, there was a study done probably 25 years ago at National Jewish. It looked like it was going to work, and then a child died. Oh, gee with the shot given in the intensive care unit. So nobody has any interest whatsoever in revisiting that, at very, least not now. Very interesting. Well, we're going to pause briefly for a public service announcement. More with allergist Dr. Martha White in a moment. We'll be right back. We're back. My guest this evening is Dr. Martha White, and we're providing an update in allergy. Dr. White, let's shift gears now to discuss atopic dermatitis and eczema. First of all, define for our viewers what are those conditions. Well, actually, they're the same thing. Atopic dermatitis is just the medical term for eczema. Right. Um, but that is an itchy skin rash. We call it the itch that rashes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in eczema, the skin gets itchy uh, very easily, like if it gets dried out. Mm -hmm. um, and if you scratch it, then you break into this rash. It's um, highly pruritic, highly itchy. We see it primarily in children, mm -hmm. babies, um, and they usually outgrow it. So what we recommend for the parents is to use moisturizers so the child doesn't dry out and feel itchy. Um, they're usually prescribed a steroid cream. We usually use something that's pretty mild. Mm -hmm. A lot of our parents are afraid to use steroid creams on their babies, but 
frankly, if you jump on the rash as soon as it starts to break out, it only takes a tiny little bit to, to settle it down. If you wait until it's awful, then you're glopping a lot of steroid over a large part of the body. So mm -hmm. I think it's better just to jump on it when, when it's tiny and stop it dead in its tracks. Um, eczema in adults is slightly different. So some, most people outgrow their eczema during early childhood, but some adults continue to have it, and um, some of them just have terrible eczema. And there's, there's actually a new medication for that. Um, it's called Depixent, and you know, it's rare that I'll call a, ma a medicine magical, but, <laughs> but this stuff, um, it's a biologic, it's a shot, it's expensive, you don't do it um, unless you have just really awful eczema. But I have seen it, um, I have seen it turn people who get looks on the street into people with nice, smooth, normal looking skin. Wow, dramatic. Yeah, it's very dramatic. Now, why do people develop atopic dermatitis in the first place? Is it an allergic reaction to a food or, or something else? It can be. So, it's again, it's a genetic predisposition. And eczema can be triggered by scratching. It can be triggered um, by allergens. And interestingly, some people get sensitized to the bacteria on our skin. So we all have staph epidermidis on our skin. Mm -hmm. a type um, that's of bacteria. A, that's right. a normal bacteria. But people with eczema uh, develop sort of an allergy to it. Um, and so part of the treatment sometimes is to use um, bleach in the bathwater to very, very dilute bleach just to, to help with that problem. Um, How interesting. Yeah. Uh, and are there any foods that trigger atopic dermatitis? Well, about 40% of children with eczema have food allergies. And so if you have food allergies and you're eating those foods, then that can cause your eczema to, to exacerbate. Interestingly, um, we've learned that if a child has a food allergy and all it does to them is make the eczema worse, the child's actually better if they go ahead and eat that food. Oh. It seems counterintuitive. We used to tell them don't do that. Um, but it turns out that if they go ahead and continue eating the food, they're less likely to develop a true allergy, that, you know, a more life-threatening type allergy. Now you've implied that the scratching also almost leads to a self-perpetuating um, reaction. That's right. So antihistamines are helpful there too. Moisturizer, try to use the steroid creams when you start to break out. Um, and use antihistamines as needed to keep from itching. The other thing is don't overheat. So people with eczema, if they get overheated, um, will tend to get itchy and they'll scratch. So we have to watch how hot it is at night when you go to bed, whether you're using too many covers, whether the child's being put in too heavy pajamas. What is it about the mechanics, though, of the scratching, the reaction to the itching, that seems to trigger an immune response? Does it activate certain immune cells? It does. Um, children with, with eczema have um, a problem with their lymphocytes in their lymphocytes or blood cells, but they also get into the skin. Um, it's a little bit different from the response that we get with allergy, mm -hmm. but, but scratching actually tends to, it, it activates, and it, I guess the easiest way to say it yeah. is it just activates an immune response that then leads to damage to the skin. So it's a self-perpetuating issue. It's a self-perpetuating yeah. issue. Speaking of allergy, let's shift gears now. I'm sure our viewers are very interested. What's the latest with hay fever and allergies in general? So briefly define for our viewers what exactly is so-called hay fever, or allergic rhinitis. Right. So in hay fever, you remember that little IgE Y-shaped molecule mm -hmm. that people make to recognize peanut and milk? Well, right. we make that same little molecule to recognize cats and dust mites and ragweed. Um, and so when that happens during the allergy season, people get runny, sneezy, itchy, congested nose. They might get itchy eyes, especially in the mm -hmm. springtime. It might trigger their asthma. Um, but it's caused by a specific immune response to pollen or to maybe mold or dust or animal dander. Cockroach. Yeah. And actually, surprisingly, in this area, a lot of people are sensitized to mouse. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure many of our viewers are wondering, well, if I have periodic nasal congestion or ear pressure, how do I separate that from, let's say, a common cold or a sinus infection? Right. So a common cold, generally everybody else is sick. Um, 
course, that's true for allergies, too, because it's the season. It's so common. But with the cold, you tend to have a fever. Mm -hmm. um, with allergies, it tends to be a little itchier, and you get it the same time every year. So frequently, people will come in and say, well, you know, I get a cold every year from March until April. Well, that's probably allergies. So mm -hmm. when you have repetitive colds, think allergy. Sure. Um, for symptomatic treatment, we tend to use the same medicines. We use over-the-counter antihistamines. Um, but for allergy, oftentimes the nasal steroid sprays, which are now over-the-counter, are helpful as well. And besides a patient coming in and giving you historical details, are there reliable testing uh, options for uh, evaluating allergic rhinitis? Yes, and I find skin testing to be much better than, um, than doing the RAS testing for allergic the blood rhinitis. Test, yeah. Right. The blood test is good for foods, not so, I don't, in my opinion, not as good for, um, for inhalant allergies. And so um, we do skin testing. One does have to be off of antihistamines for at least a week for the skin testing to be valid. Now, besides the over-the-counter antihistamine pills and now the over-the-counter nasal sprays, uh, if somebody is having inadequate relief from those options, what other options do you offer a patient? Well, the first thing is find out what you're allergic to. So if you're allergic to dust mites, that's, you have exposure to them year-round. Those are these tiny little bugs that eat our dead skin after it flakes off. We all have them. They sound gross, they're, but they're microscopic. Um, and they burrow down into the pillows and mattress. Um, and so they make allergy encasings that go over the pillows, over the mattress. It zips up, and then you put your bedding over top of that. So that almost instantaneously cuts down on your exposure to dust mites. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're allergic to seasonal pollen outside, close your windows mm -hmm. so it stays outdoors. Um, but if you're doing those things, you've already found out what you're allergic to, you're still unhappy that, you know, with your symptoms despite your medications, then allergy immunotherapy would be a, a very good option for somebody who has allergies. So-called allergy shots. Allergy shots. And, and most people are on the shots. There's also an option to do the same drops under the tongue. Really? Um, yes, yeah. but most of those are not FDA approved, so it's oh, generally cheaper to do it um, by way of allergy shots. Are they equally effective? That's a great question. Nobody's done a head-to-head -head comparison of the two. My sense is that the shots are probably more effective, but I haven't seen a head-to-head -head trial to, yeah. to know that for sure. Now, the allergy shots, once you commit to it, what kind of a time frame are you looking at? Most people are on the top dose shots for about three to five years, and it takes about seven months to get up to the dose that starts working. So if you are thinking about starting allergy shots, just be aware that for the first year, you're probably going to be on a weekly shot, and then it gradually stretches out to once a month over the course of the next year and a half or so. But you need to be into it for the long haul if you want it to really do a good job. But it's the only way to make your allergies go away. So it's the closest thing to a cure that we've got. Now, at the end of, let's say, the three- to five-year mm -hmm. timeline, what happens then? Well, I wait for people to stop having symptoms or at least get as good as they seem to be capable of getting seasonally. Um, you then stop your allergy shots. And for most people, the benefit is good for many years. So on average, if you've been on shots for about five years, it's another five years before the symptoms start to slowly creep back. Um, but to put it in um, perspective, for people who had shots as children, I might see them again when they're in their 30s, and they might think maybe let's do it again at that age, and then usually they don't need it again. Right. 95% um, of people who have allergies who go on shots get a lot better with it, and kids do even better. Now, once they're done with the injection schedule, let's say five mm -hmm. years into it, do they still need medicine for allergies, or do they often go without anything? They often go without anything. I mean, my aim is to get them so they went through an allergy season and went, wow, those flowers were really pretty. Yeah. Was this an allergy season? Terrific. <laughs> yeah. Now, sometimes I suspect you have patients say, well, you know, I have a friend who's diabetic and takes insulin at home, mm -hmm. and I have another friend who has Crohn's disease, and they take their injections at home. Um, can I self-administer my allergy shots? And that you is say, nope. <laughs> No, that's a great question. Um, the risk from an allergy shot is allergic reactions because uh, when you get an allergy shot, you're getting what you're actually allergic to. So it would be dangerous to do your shots yourself at home. You need to be where there's a doctor or a prescriber of some sort who can actually treat you if you have a reaction. 
Most people don't have dangerous reactions, but if you do, you don't want to be that person at home doing it. So to put it in perspective, I'm on allergy shots. Um, I will not let my staff give me a shot unless there's another doctor in the office and I know that person's going to be there for at least a half an hour. Sure. And uh, if somebody does have a bad reaction, what, what, how do you respond? Then you give them epinephrine. Epinephrine. So it's the same stuff that you would use for a food allergy. Sure, yeah. sure. Let's uh, shift gears to discuss asthma. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, define for our viewers what exactly is asthma. Asthma is an inflammatory disorder in the lungs. It's reversible. So um, if you think of how when you get a cut, you get sort of swollen around the cut, and it gets mm -hmm. um, kind of gooey and red, that can happen inside of the lungs. And when that happens, um, people start feeling short of breath. They start coughing. They might wheeze. Um, those symptoms sort of come and go uh, for most people. Um, and so it's a reversible inflammatory disorder. It gets triggered by things like exercise, cold air exposure, um, allergies, and then irritants like cigarette smoke. We have one minute left. Briefly mm -hmm. tell our viewers what are the treatment options for asthma. Um, for very mild asthma that's, that occurs rarely, we use just albuterol. It's a bronchodilator. Quick fix makes an, you feel an better. An inhaler. An mm -hmm. inhaler. Yeah. Um, and then there are inhalers that are um, anti-inflammatory steroid inhalers, and those are the ones that take care of the inflammation. They're maintenance, everyday inhalers to keep you under good control. Are there pills for asthma? There is a pill. It's called, uh, well, there's a couple of them. They're, they're um, leukotriene inhibitors, and they're very mild anti-inflammatories, but they're controller drugs as well. Very good. Well, uh, Dr. White, if our viewers have any questions, how can they reach you? Uh, they can contact us on our website, uh, allergyasthma.us, or they can call us 301-962-5800. Dr. White, thank you for joining us at House Call. Thank you. I appreciate it. My thanks to Dr. Martha White for a terrific interview about allergy. My thanks to my team here at the station. And, of course, my thanks to you, the viewer. Tell us how we're doing. You can reach me at my practice website, montgomerygastro.com. As for our next show, it's going to be a very important one. We're going to have Amir Tober, a certified uh, trainer in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, sharing with you a few important tips that could be potentially life-saving. After all, what would you do if you were at home or at work and somebody suddenly had a cardiac arrest? Watch this program. Look forward to seeing you then next time on another edition of House Call. Good evening. <laughs>